Hello and a welcome to day two of Slipper Camp. Um, our first presenter today uh, is Jason Ninos, and we are so lucky to have Jason, who is newish to Plymouth State. So we were just talking about how some folks haven't had a chance to meet him because we've been remote for a portion of his of his time. Um, Jason uh, is our coordinator of academic technology for the university and definitely our number one um, Moodle czar. So uh, high level Moodle issues are, um, are Jason's area. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jason, but I will let everyone know that we do have 15 minutes planned at the end of Jason's half hour session, maybe even more to ask questions. Um, so you can use the chat to ask questions along the way, but otherwise just hold on and um, he will probably get to them and it's perfectly fine for you all to participate and ask your questions. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Jason. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, guys. Uh, so yes, I am the academic technology coordinator for the university, um, i.e. the new old Katie Martell, just in case every, you know, everyone needs that connection. Um, just some back, quick background about me. I'm a former K-12 teacher. I taught US history and government and English in Phoenix, Arizona, Winslow, Arizona, where I did stand on a corner, as I said, um, and Washington, DC. Um, after that, I transitioned out of the classroom and into um, instructional coaching for technology, where I have worked with teachers on how to integrate technology into their teaching practices. And I've done that for a high school district. I did that for the Arizona Department of Education. And then I did it for Arizona State before I came here to Plymouth. Um, and so I'm just going to talk about Moodle and a couple different tools within Moodle that we have to help you with this, you know, work with this concept of high flex um, and kind of getting things, you know, set up to try to make it flow a little bit easier. Um, so you can see the first thing I've done, I'm in my Moodle course and I just kind of played around with the, with the organization of it with our settings. And so you can see I've started organizing it where I have week one face to face week one online. And so you can, you know, put these materials here. Um, so students can see what they, you know, what they might have to do if they're going to try to attend face to face or what they're going to attend online. Um, and so you open up the columns here and set that up. And the way I got that how it works out is if I go to my administration and course administration and click edit settings here, I can scroll down and under course format, my format is collapse topics and then number of columns is two. And so, and then you can kind of change around, mess around with some of these things um, to find a way that works for you. I did try to do three columns at once. Um, in this case, I want to try to differentiate between online synchronous and online asynchronous but that one kind of got a little bit messy, uh, but it's possible to do it. But I've, from what I can tell, it seemed like two was kind of the best, uh, best way to do that. So if I go and put my format here, and I'll go back to two, and then you can mess around with vertical or horizontal, but from what I can tell, in my opinion, horizontal is the uh, best way to do it. And so, and then you just click the pencil to rename your sections here. So I can say week three face to face and make sure I hit enter, otherwise it doesn't save. And so I can change my uh, topics right there in order to get a little more course organization so the students can get a little better understanding of what they're, um, what they're doing. Um, so that's one thing, um, little thing, but it can be very helpful. Um, yes, Judy, you can do that to a course that's already set up. This course was already set up. Basically, if I set it up, if I already have all my course materials in here, because this was, this is my sandbox course. And when I started doing this, I had the um, columns as one. And all it really does is just then, so you can see I have, this was normally one, it was section one, section two, section three, section four, section five, and so on and so forth. And so when I change the settings here, it did just take the sections and they still go in numerical order. It's just, I had changed the names of them. So that is um, how you can set that up. Um, so Irene, I will 
get to, we can look at that question in the, at the end. Um, the other thing that could be helpful for you guys as you're doing this um, is outcomes. So if I am in my course administration and I click on outcomes here, you can set up outcomes for your different activities in your course. And so if we're, yesterday we were talking about um, having a, you know, kind of backwards designing. What are your outcomes for the course? Okay, what are your assignments to help with those outcomes? Okay, and so on and so forth. And so what you can do is actually attach outcomes to your assignments. And we have some outcomes here, but if I want to add a new outcome, which I've gone to under my course administration by and then clicking outcomes, so right here, if I can click on edit outcomes, I can add a new outcome here. And I can say, you know, reading comprehension. No one can type when everyone's watching him. So if I, my spelling is atrocious because everyone's watching. Um, I can do different scales in order to do that, in order to measure that, whether it be um, satisfactory or um, default confidence scale, or I wanna add a new scale, I can do that. I guess I do wanna leave, and I would give it a name, Jason's scale. And then you, from here, you can click on it and it says, define an order list of values regarding, ranging from negative to positive, separated by commas. And so if I said, you know, um, not great, better, getting better, awesome. That is a very good scale there. Um, so I can click save changes and so now I have a scale here that I can then apply for measuring my outcomes. And so to apply those outcomes to an assignment, if I go back to my course and I'm editing an assignment here in my settings, under my settings for outcomes, I can apply different outcomes to the, uh, to the courses. And so right now this assignment has a writing outcome. And so what that means is when I go in to grade it, I have my outcomes here and I can choose where they're hitting on that outcome. And so once I click that, I can click save changes and that outcomes then applied. So any questions about the outcomes before I move forward? Yes, students would see the uh, would see the outcome. Do outcomes affect the grade book? Um, when you it doesn't if when you put an outcome in there, it does change it does set a score if you haven't put one in there already. So you can, so can you record a grade and an outcome for one assignment? Yes. So I can say, you know, this is exceeds expectations and give you an 85. And so that, you know, sets that up. All right. So I'm going to move forward. If there's other questions, you know, throw them in the chat box or we'll have some time at the end. Um, so the, there's some other things that we can, that are tied into Moodle or that we plugged into Moodle that it can be helpful. Um, one tool is H5P, and this could be really good for your online students or your face-to-face -face when you want them to get a, some little additional practice. Um, and so if I look at, I have a couple ones set up here. One is the accordion, which is an easy way to, exp, you know, display topics and informations. So, you know, I can have my heading here and then different things that come, come down below it whenever I click that heading. Um, drag and drop. So on this one, I can, you know, you can see I have a continent, I have a map here and I can say, you know, label your continents. If I click check, oh no, that's not great. 
So I can click retry. And let's try this again. And I got, got them both correct. And so these are all, you know, H5P is a great way to kind of build some um, knowledge checks as the students are working through material or you're working with them to see where they're at. Um, hotspot. So I can choose, I can set up a question and then I think this one got set up right. Um, so there's a lot of different options and the way you can add an H5P activity is if you click on add activity or resource and then H5P interactive content. I would obviously give it a name. And then here's the, all the different options you can choose from between having a chart, the drag and drop, finding a hotspot, um, dragging words, fill in the blanks, and so on and so forth. So obviously I'm not gonna cover each, uh, all these, every single one of these. Um, you can always reach out to, reach out to me and we can set up a time if you want some more help. Um, but these are all great tools to utilize different, uh, different formative or uh, summative assessments that are just a regular quiz. Yes, it is H5P. And so we have this tied into Moodle. If you set it a grade, the grade does pass back to the grade book. So you can see maximum grade here, they get it right. The grade does pass back over to the grade book. And I wanna say one more thing about H5P too, which is that you know, if you get a little bit of practice with it, it's a cool technology that we're starting to use more with Pressbooks, which Erica is going to talk about later today. But ultimately, if you build some units um, of interactive stuff for your students, you can actually use those interactively and interoperably with other technologies as well. So folks are building um, books for their classes, like course packs or textbooks, and they're using these little interactive modules um, inside of them. So H5P, you know, maybe not when you're feeling overwhelmed and busy, but when you're ready for a new thing to think about, it's a really interesting technology that you can use for all sorts of cool stuff. Um, so I would recommend taking a peek if you have time. Yes, yep. Uh, when, I came, when I was coming from Arizona State to Plymouth, I saw they had H5P, I was really excited because it's something I'd used in the past but hadn't had integrated into their learning management system. Um, the other thing we're gonna talk about real fast is Kaltura. Um, we all know that Kaltura is a way you can store your videos and then display them into the course. Um, but the other thing you can do is a Kaltura video quiz. And so if you're gonna do asynchronous, you know, give your students an asynchronous session, um, one of the things that, you know, we get you know, that we get afraid of is that they just become a passive viewer of the video. And so what you can do is with Kaltura, you can actually integrate a uh, quiz questions into the video. And I say quiz questions remotely you now with, with parentheses, it's not really, it doesn't have to be with the grades, but it at least adds that element of interactivity where you would normally pause in a lecture and say, okay, you know, what do you think? Or what's the, you know, what's the answer to this question? And so I can, put it right into Moodle and I'll show you how to get the starting of the quiz set up. And you can see in this video, you'll be given a quiz, good luck. You can change what it says here. And as I click continue, you can see I have these demarkers here. And so as it's playing, it's gonna get to the first question. Should have put it a little bit earlier, but. So it, it's gonna pause and then you can see here's a question. Who is the speaker? Is it Jason? Is it Jimmy? Is it Paul? I can click select and then the video proceeds forward. And then if we go to the next question here, move forward as, the, uh, as it comes up to it, it will stop what were the speakers doing? And then they can put in a short response. They were joking and click save. And so if you wanted to give your, you know, eight minutes 
you know, topic discussion on it or talk about something, you can add this interactivity in it. So your students aren't just sitting there passively getting the information, but allows them to actually contribute or respond to something as if they were semi in the classroom. Um, the way you can actually work with your Kaltura videos is if you go into Kaltura and you can get into Kaltura from your My Courses tab. So if I click Add New, I can do Video Quiz. And then from here, I would choose a video that I would want to utilize. And if I don't have it here, I can upload a new media. And so then I can utilize this and say, add a question at this 26 second mark. And I can do a multiple choice, true, false, reflection point, which is just um, for them, us to play a place for it to pause and you can put text in there um, and an open-ended question. Um, so Judy asks, can you use a video that you did not create to still make a quiz in? Yes, if you can upload the video to your to Kaltura, you can utilize any video. Um, can you set the quiz to give answers right after they, they try or only at the end of the video? I believe you can set up to show the correct answer, um, but I'll have to double check that, um, Rebecca. And so you can see it's pretty easy to utilize. You can also give tips, you know, hints or why and work within that. So that's how you can get it set up. And then when you want to add it, just like you're adding a Kaltura video resource, you just add activity or resource. And then you would do Kaltura video resource and it would appear in your um, media section here. And it would just say, see, call, and it would say that's the quiz because it says quiz and I can select that. Two more things, and then I'll be completely open for discussion. Um, you know, one of the things that we always are fearful with our forums is that they're all text-based. And one of the things that you can actually do within our forums here is actually do video discussion forums. Um, so you can see I put a video discussion, so for my introduction, and then if I click on this discussion topic, a video can load that your students can record, could have recorded with Kaltura. And so the way this works is if I click reply here, in my message box here when it loads, over on the right, I have embed Kaltura media. And so if they can record their response with Kaltura, so if they haven't pre-recorded, they can click add new media upload And so they can record themselves responding to your prompt or another student's uh, prompt. So instead of um, a text-based discussion board, you could do a video discussion board. You know, granted, you want to make sure all your students, you know, have the capability to do it with the bandwidth to upload it. Because I know there's cases around here where students don't have a high-speed internet connection. Um, but you can do a video discussion board where students can interact via the video instead of just text. And as Herring Harrington pointed out, this would be brilliant for a language class. Yeah, this would be a great way for them to practice um, a conversation asynchronously. All right, one last thing I'm gonna show, and this came up from our semi-discussion. Um, poll everywhere isn't something that is part of um, our packages right now, but it's a plugin for Google Slides and PowerPoint that you can do, um, you can 
include interaction in your presentation. And the reason I bring this up is when we were talking before I started, Mary was talking about, you know, interactivity in their, um, in their Zoom synchronous sessions. And this is the tool I used in my face-to-face -face class, but whenever I taught using a Zoom synchronous, I would use Poll Ever also, because what happens is if I click on my presentation here, this comes up and students would be able to go to polleb.com and that link and then type in a response to my question and it would appear on my on my list here and so you know this is a way for you to get some interactivity in order to while you're doing a synchronous synchronous lesson now this is something you would have to install on your own uh, onto your system um, and so, but you can install the link at poll, if you go to polleverywhere.com and find the downloads and I'll give a link to Robin to put on our resource page. Um, you can get that set up to include in your, in your item. And so I'm trying to see if I can put a response here. And so I actually responded and you can see it comes up right on the screen here. Um, you can use this is that was an open ended question. There's also multiple choice. So on my phone here. You can see I can see the question or the students can see on their computer and I can choose a response and it updates it right on the screen. And so this is another tool. Like I said, this one's not included on your system right now. I'm trying to get the um, the IT crowd to start putting this on default with your system because it is free to use for higher education. It's just limited as you can collect 40 responses per question, uh, which for most of our class is not a problem because I don't think we have more than uh, many classes more than with more than 40 students. Um, is my Moodle sandbox available for us to peruse? No, it is not. Um, but if you ever want to meet up, I can, you know, we can sit and, and talk about things you want to do. So that's my stick. I think I got about 10 minutes left. And so now is the time you can do it. Ask questions. You don't have to do it in the chat. You have a microphone that you can uh, uh, speak up and ask a question. Yeah, we are actually here until um, nine o'clock. So oh. we've got uh, 15, 20 minutes uh, almost. So you can keep using the chat, but it probably would be easier um, if maybe, since we do have a lot of people here, 56 people, um, maybe just type your name in the chat and that will alert me that you have a question and then we can call on you just in case lots of people want to ask. So um, I, yes, the next, question, the next session does start at nine o'clock. Um, uh, okay, so if you have a question, just say, I have a question in the chat and we will get going. Even if they're specific, I think it's fine because Jason can walk us through. So let's start with Annie Hager. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Robin. Thanks for this. This is great. Um, this, is, I'm, this is not a question about what you've presented so far this morning, but um, the grade book has driven me crazy this semester. Uh -huh. And I was wondering if you could just maybe model the way that you use the, the grade book for some of these assignments? Um, so this would be a tough one because I don't have a class to model. I don't necessarily have a class that's going to show a grade book, but I can at least show you. Um, so right now you have, if I go to my assignment, anytime you make an assignment in your grade book, it sets up like this. Everything's just in there. Um, what I generally recommend, and because I know most instructors, what they do, most instructors is the um, kind of like a weighted where assignments are worth X percentage and, and quizzes are worth Y percentage and things like that. And so to get that set up for your course total, you're going to want weighted means, of, weighted means of grades. And right now, all the weights are equal. But then we need to, um, you can add a category to put things into the categories that they're reflected of. And so let's say I have a, a homework. And what I generally suggest is in your categories, you do natural for the aggregation. And what that means is 
it takes the total points that are in that category. So for example, let's say I move all of these into my homework category. And so because this is natural, basically it says there's 500 points in this. They have their points earned divided by total points. In this case, was the 500 and that calculates their grade. And let's say I wanna make this worth 25% of my grade. So under my weights here, I would do 25 and click save changes. And that would make it so that it's 25% of my overall grade. And then I would want to set up my other categories here and have my weights equal up to obviously 100 in order to kind of set up my grade book. Can I ask a follow up? Yes. Um, say I now want to go and see how Betty Crocker is doing. Um, so if I want to see how Betty Crocker is doing, I can click on user report in my grade administration and select my user, Betty Crocker, and I can see how she's doing in the course. And so I entered the grade wrong for her hotspot assignment. Um, so if I go to my grader report here, so this is going to be slightly different because for the hotspot, it drags it over, it, it, you know, because it was the H5P activity. But if I click on, let's say, let's not use a hotspot, let's use this quick grade test, my assignment, I can just go into their grader report and I need to, actually, I can just go into the assignment from here and click grade and change her grade. The other thing that comes up, let's say you have a quiz. So like she took this quiz and you know what, I'm going to give her a couple extra credit points. Not this way. If I go to my grader report and I find that column. So let's say I want to change her score for this quiz. I can overwrite it. Sorry, I should have told you how I got to the screen. If I click on the pencil for that column, I can see every, you know, everyone's score and I can click override and say, you know what, I'm going to give you some extra credit points. You get 95. And then I can say extra credit for blah. I click save. And so when I go back to my greater report, I can see anything that's gold here, I've overridden. So that tells me I've gone into this screen and changed the grade that was originally given. All right. Thank I know you. there's a couple other people who had some questions. Yeah, so before we get to KDW's question, um, let's just do Roxana's because it's related. How do H5P activities connect to the grade book? Um, so they just connect to the grade book via their grade column. So you can see if I go back to my um, setup, they're worth 10 points or whatever you set up for their maximum grade. And then they, when they complete the task, they get those points. And so if I want to change the, um, change the grade or what, how much they're worth, I can just change that under the settings and I can say maximum grade is, you know, 100. Um, let's go to KDW for a question. Hi, um, thanks Jason. I have um, maybe one quick question, although that brought up another question for me. Um, my quick question was just uh, with Poll Everywhere, is there any discussion about purchasing the license so we can attach Poll Everywhere responses to a grade book? Um, there's always discussion on, you know, whether that's gonna happen. I don't know, I don't know for sure. Um, there's a lot of moving parts in it, especially with the consolidation of IT across the university system. And I'm not, gonna sh I'm not sure how that's gonna affect um, budgetary and software adoption. Um, I'm an advocate of it. Um, I probably, what, what's gonna happen is we have to see what the rest of the system is using if they're using response systems, because there's other things that you can utilize like Top Hat or um, um, clickers is what they're called and, um, for another uh, software. And so it's just a matter of what the university system goes with if they have a software response system. The biggest reason I just re recommend Pull Everywhere is because it's easy to use. It's easy to integrate into PowerPoint and Google Slides. Um, and it's free up to, you know, free to use for higher education. <clears throat> you just have the 
you just have the things like you talked about, does connect to the gradebook right away, and you can have a limit of 40 responses per question. Thanks. Um, we have a question from Irene. Okay, I'm unmuted. Hi, everybody. Thank Hello. you. Thanks, Jason. I have a question with discussion boards. Okay. I want to grade them. Yep. And the students have to respond to two other people. So they have to do three posts per discussion. Yep. I don't, I can't figure out how to assess it. So I'm constantly having to go in and overwrite the discussion board. First I tried rating, then I, that didn't work. So can you assist? Um, so there's kind of, yeah, the rating is one way to do it. Um, and I don't have a discussion board set up super great. Hold on, let me look at this one. Um, unfortunately, wait, let's see. I, unfortunately, I just don't have a discussion board set up where I have students had posted something. Um, so one thing, that, one thing that make it slightly easier to find where your students have posted, if you click into a discussion board, you have the search forms up in the top right hand corner. Uh -huh. First, I would click on that. And then you have ways you can search. So let's search by author. So I'm gonna say myself. And then you can choose what forms you want to search. Oh, and so if I say cool. search forums, okay, I can see all their posts in this forum. Oh, perfect. Okay, thanks. And so then if I want to see this post in context, I can see it and I can see where they posted that, whether it's a original post or a response to somebody. Now, can, how would you grade it? What did you do it? What do you do in the administrator for edit settings to give a grade? Um, so if I go to edit settings, yeah. And I think you were on it at one point. Yeah. Um, ratings. Right. I want to do the um, average of average of ratings because you're gonna only average it once. Right. Uh, you're only gonna grade it once. And it's usually always worth ten. Okay, great. Average of ratings. Um, Perfect. Okay. And then you would rate it. I don't have a student in here to rate. That's okay. Um, I know how to do it from there. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Question, Jason, uh, related to discussions um, that Bridget asks there. She wants to know, can you turn off the default um, notification so that students are not managing hundreds of emails across their courses? How do you do that with the default, even though individual users can do it? So individual users can do it. Um, basically, they're only, whenever an individual user is in a discussion, you can look over here on this administration when I'm in a discussion board or forum, there's optional subscription for subscription. And basically they can subscribe to it and they automatically subscribe to it when they make a post and they're subscribed to that discussion. But they come in here. So meaning like if I post this, anybody who replies, I get a um, email from it. But if I don't want, if a student doesn't want to, they can click unsubscribe from this discussion here and then that wouldn't send them any more notifications. I see, I, I kind of have a follow-up to that. Um, the issue though that happened this past semester was, I don't know if students were all fully aware of that. And so I had a lot of students mention to me that they were literally getting like hundreds and hundreds of emails when anyone in their class was yep. posting something. And so they, like, they weren't getting messages from me that I was sending because they said like they would have all of these all of these things and so I don't know if our if it's I mean if each of us as instructors needs to help guide them in doing that that's one thing but I wonder if I don't know if you can do this as like the boss of Moodle but can we could it be something where the default is set where students it would be off and the students would have to opt in to get those is that that's not possible I don't think that's possible because that probably would be affect a global setting and it would affect all discussion forums and if we, I know that instructors rely on those, especially the announcements, which is actually a forum in order to send out information. And so I would be hesitant to mess around with that setting um, because of it's, a, um, setting my, it's a setting that might affect all forums across the, um, across the system. So, but I will make sure we have a help article um, that shows how to unsubscribe to a forum. 
Um, question from Becky. Hi, thanks Robin. Uh, Jason, when you were showing us a minute ago how to work with the override um, screen and, and how to enter grades, um, you didn't show the way that I always do it, which is to turn editing on and the greater report screen and enter on that screen. Is there any reason not to enter on enter grades on that screen, but rather to go to the individual grade item feedback page? Nope. You can, the only, the only reason is that you don't have the feedback built in. Mm -hmm. So if you overwrite a grade, Generally, you know, I consider good practice if I'm overriding a grade, I'm going to put a comment why I'm overriding that grade. Mm. So that way I know why and the student knows why. So at the end of the semester, when they say, why is my grade like this? And I look at the scores, I can be like, oh, yeah, I graded you that way because of X, Y, Z. Okay, thanks. Yep. Anybody else? Um. I just want to remind you all that the recording will be up because I actually can imagine wanting, shockingly to me, Jason, shockingly, I can imagine wanting to watch this Moodle workshop two times, um, which really surprises me. Uh, so good job. Um, it'll take us a while to get all these videos processed um, and uh, and up on the site, but uh, we'll do that along with whatever other links Jason wants to supply. Um, if there aren't any questions right now, I also want to remind you that Thursday and Friday in the CoLab um, virtual office, of course, 8.30 to 5, we have drop-in hours where we'll have lots of people on all the big teams there to assist you, and Jason will be one of those people for a number of those hours, so um, you can pop in then and get some drop-in help if you want to like set up a grade book say or um, anything like that. Any other questions before we conclude this particular workshop? One other thing, read your communication out from from the IT people because we do have drop-in sessions during the weeks or during the weeks and whatnot where if you drop in I'm guaranteed myself to be there to help you. So otherwise you can always reach out to email and reach out to me by email um, to ask, you know, set up an appointment to work with you individually. Um, Bob, do you want to ask a quick question before we finish? Bob Heiner? Bob said he had a question about troubleshooting grades. I'm pretty sure it was Bob. Am yeah. I on? Yep. Okay. Yep. Uh, Jason, what do you do if uh, your grades aren't adding up right? I I calculate them by hand. I have another software resident on my computer and the grades uh, that I calculate are slightly off for one of my classes, like a few tenths of a percent. So is there a, something I should do to try and troubleshoot that? I don't see anything wrong with my grade book settings. Um, that one I can't really answer off the top of my head. We might need to look at that a little, uh, a little more closely individually. Um, and see where that description might come up. Okay. All right. Thanks. Yep. Okay, I am going to stop recording on this session.